$200 reward. Run away from the subscriber. $200 reward. Run away. Run away from the subscriber. Negro slave. Run away slave. I have heard that so many slaves escaped into freedom along a route that could not be ascertained that the slave owners said there must be an underground railroad under the Ohio River and on to the north. Colonel William Cotton, abolitionist, 1854. Said her name was Harriet Tubman, and she drove for the underground railroad. Harriet Tubman was born a slave in Bucktown, Maryland. She was one of 11 children, and she was beaten daily because they wanted to break her spirit. She, went, she was never a submissive child. She was a spitfire, they called her. At the age of five and six years old, anything that she did wrong, they would beat her with lashes across her face, her neck, and her back. Now, when children are supposed to be playing, this little girl was being beaten to break her spirit. As a teenager, Harriet tried twice to flee with her brothers, but both attempts were unsuccessful. The next time I go, Harriet vowed, I'm going to go alone. She had a prized quilt, and she traded her quilt in for information about the Underground Railroad. And she struck out for freedom in the summer of 1849. She had vowed, she said, there was one of two things I have a right to, liberty or death. If I can have one, I will have the other. No man shall take me alive. I will fight for my liberty. And when the time comes for me to go, only the Lord will let them kill me. As so many before her had done, Harriet set out with no plan or destination only to follow the drinking gourd, the North Star, to freedom. The route through Eastern Maryland was treacherous, filled with armed patrols on horseback and bloodhounds. Placards advertising rewards for the capture of runaway slaves were posted at every tavern and crossroads. But Harriet persevered and arrived in Philadelphia. I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person now I was free. There was such a glory over everything. I felt like I was in heaven. Harriet Tubman. Her freedom was just not enough for her. She thought about her, her friends. She thought about her other relatives. And so she vowed to go back. She had the name of Moses. Because of her ventures of going back repeatedly into slave territory. From 1850 to the outbreak of civil war, Harriet Tubman returned south some 19 times to personally conduct as many as 300 fugitives, including her own mother and father and those brothers who had tried twice and failed. Again and again, Harriet went back through the eastern shore of Maryland, through the Great Dismal Swamp, across the Delaware River, and 500 miles more into St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, where the runaways would be safe. So great was her courage, so triumphant her success, that planters in Maryland offered a $40,000 reward for her capture the highest bounty ever offered for any worker on the Underground Railroad. And to never have been captured? She often boasted, I've never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. And that was true.
Tubman was assisted by Thomas Garrett, a white abolitionist from Wilmington, Delaware, who, like William Still, was a clearinghouse for information between fugitives and those still enslaved. He was in charge of fundraising and correspondence between strategic conductors along Tubman's route. And Garrett was outspoken, so he was continually threatened, jailed, and fined for his Underground Railroad activities. But to the end, he remained stalwart, even before a federal judge at Wilmington's Old Town Hall. In this courthouse, Garrett was ordered to pay $5,600 in damages to the owner of a slave he had helped to freedom. Instead of showing contrition, Garrett was defiant. In 25 years, I have assisted over 1,400 on their way to the north, and I now consider the penalty imposed to be as a license for the remainder of my life. You may take everything I have, but if any of you know of any slave who needs my assistance, send him to me. Thomas Garrett, 1858. When Thomas Garrett died in 1871, his coffin was put on a wagon for the steep uphill climb from his home to the Apoquinami Friends Meeting House. A group of black men, former runaways and free men, stood in the middle of the road and refused to let the wagon pass. Instead, they took Thomas Garrett's coffin and put it on their shoulders and walked up that steep hill. They wanted to carry their friend to his final resting place. The Underground Railroad is, I think, important because it makes the point that some people were able to overcome the socialization of their culture. That is a socialization which provided for the notion that race was really important and whites were superior to blacks. And that it was possible for these blacks and whites to work together in this interracial movement. And for every Thomas Garrett and Harriet Tubman, there were thousands more who we can never know. Runaway slaves and impromptu conductors alike who built their own lines along the Underground Railroad and then simply disappeared into obscurity. The emphasis on conductors, stations, and depots and the use of those terms has made people think of it as more programmatic than it actually was. In reality, many runaways ran away without aid from anyone, had planned their escape briefly, but it was essentially opportunistic. In the morning, it might be a better idea for you to steal a canoe and cross the river or go up river, or that might be a bad idea that morning because people are after you and it's better to stay in the woods, although you will not make much time that way. So it's a very much seat of the pants, make it up as you go along kind of decision process. Although there were organized chapters of abolition and vigilant societies along the eastern seaboard, to the west there was a much more grassroots kind of underground railroad in operation. Slaves escaping from Mississippi, Louisiana, Missouri, and Kentucky had no idea that there were well-funded organizations in the east. They just knew that if they could get north and across the Ohio River, someone would help them to freedom. The Ohio River was a very important part of the Underground Railroad. In fact, it's estimated that over half of the slaves who escaped uh, made their crossing at some point in that corridor. But getting across was another matter. Nearly a mile wide in most spots, the deep, swift flowing Ohio River is full of snags and contradictory currents. In addition to that, of course, uh, is the fact that uh, in those days, uh, most individuals, and, and certainly most African Americans, uh, did not swim. So you get to the, uh, you get to the water's edge, and there was freedom. It, it's so close you can taste it. And yet, how are you going to get across? With wild cries and desperate energy, slipping, stumbling, springing upwards, she saw nothing, felt nothing, till dimly, as in a dream, she saw the Ohio side, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852. 
The story of Eliza and her harrowing flight to freedom across the Ohio River captivated and enraged tens of thousands of Americans who were reading Harriet Beecher Stowe's new novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was Eliza's story, many historians believe, that crystallized the anti-slavery movement in America, propelling us toward civil war. After Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the book, slave owners came out to say that this was fiction. But Harriet based uh, most of her characters uh, on things that she had seen. She says that the descriptions of Eliza she got from a minister, and apparently that did affect enough people because a lot of people said we didn't know that this was going on until after the book was written. The book was fiction, but Eliza Harris was not. The character was based on a real woman who had crossed the Ohio River not far from Stowe's home in Walnut Hills, Ohio. The real Eliza Harris was trying to reach a little town called Ripley. Not many people know about Ripley, Ohio today, but in the 1840s and 50s, everybody knew Ripley. It was Freedom Town, USA. Swing along, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing along, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. What did I see coming for to carry me home? A band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. For slaves escaping along the western route of the Underground Railroad, the Jordan was the Ohio River and the band of angels were the abolitionists on the other side. Most of the cities and towns along the north shore of the Ohio River had anti-slavery sympathizers, and it was through the slave grapevine that runaways came to know that a lantern in the window on the free side was a signal that a safe house was within reach. And there was one town in particular where lanterns burned brightly almost every night. Ripley, Ohio. I think uh, Ripley became an important stop on the Underground Railroad in part because of its location. They say location is everything, and I think that's true in this story. It was right on the Ohio River. On the opposite side of the Ohio River is Kentucky, which was a border state that, was, that had pro-slavery and anti-slavery activity going on. And, um, we were in the right location at the right time. Ripley was the home of Senator Alexander Campbell, Ohio's first abolitionist. He was a persuasive speaker for the cause, and by 1854, the Ripley Abolition Society had a membership of 300, nearly the entire population of the town. And according to several sources, including Harriet Beecher Stowe herself, it was Ripley that the real-life Eliza Harris was trying to reach when she plunged into the icy waters of the Ohio River with her baby in her arms. As in a dream, she saw the Ohio side and a man helping her up the bank. Save me, save me, do hide me, said Eliza. The best I can do is to tell you to go far, said he. You've earned your liberty, and ye shall have it. Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852. For the real-life Eliza, thar was a rickety staircase leading up from the Ohio River to the home of Reverend John Rankin. It was an uphill struggle uh, to get to freedom. And, of course, the, the, the Rankin House, uh, which was one of the uh, major... Uh, stops, uh, first stops on the Underground Railroad uh, was uh, one of the more important ones. His house still stands atop Liberty Hill, the highest point in Ripley. The Rankins chose this location because of its visibility and they, their, their home was on a hill overlooking the village of Ripley and the Ohio River and the Kentucky Hills and they kept a lantern or a lamp in their window 
every evening, and that was the beacon, almost like the North Star, and that was a sign to escaping slaves that this was a safe house and they were welcome here, they would be sheltered and fed and cared for, and when safe, moved on to the next station north. For 40 years, John Rankin, a Presbyterian minister, and his family harbored as many as 2,000 fugitive slaves, his sons ready to defend them with guns. Some runaways stayed in Ripley and established a free black settlement known as Africa on the Hill. Most were ferried on, among them the real-life Eliza and Lewis Hayden, the same Lewis Hayden who would travel on to Boston to become a famous abolitionist and station master himself. Reverend Rankin was outspoken and paid a price for it. Twice attempts were made to burn down his house and Kentucky slave owners had a standing reward of $2,500 for the abduction or assassination of Reverend Rankin. Perhaps that is why, less than a mile away, another man who was also harboring fugitive slaves kept quiet and kept to himself. He kept so quiet, in fact, that his story was almost lost. His name was John P. Parker. Parker's contribution to the Underground Railroad was, first of all, he was one of the men who took the chance to go actually cross the river over into slave territory and, and pick up uh, these freedom seekers. And for, a, for an African American, if he had been caught, he was either, you know, he could have been killed uh, on the spot, uh, he could have been re-enslaved, uh, or else he would have uh, 10 to 20 years in the, in the state penitentiary. John Parker was himself a former slave who ran away twice and failed both times. By working extra jobs on the side for his master and others, Parker was able to save enough money over a 20-year period to purchase his freedom in 1845 for the extraordinary sum of $1,800. The real injury of slavery was the making of a human being an animal without hope. Now that it's all over, I know slavery's curse was not the pain of the body, but the pain of the soul. John P. Parker, 1880. Parker led a dual life. By day, he worked in an iron foundry. By night, he ferried fugitives across the Ohio River. Almost nightly, he would make a trip over to the other side and just see, you know, if there were any African Americans uh, waiting to be saved. It is an irony that this man is unknown in terms of there's no picture of him. And yet, in, in a way, it's almost symbolic of the business that he was involved in. You don't want people to know what you look like. Eventually, Parker would purchase his own foundry and become one of the first African Americans to obtain patents for a number of important inventions, including a tobacco press and a soil pulverizer designed to replace the need for slave labor by performing the work of 100 men. He sent four of his children to college. His daughter Hortense Parker was one of the first African Americans to graduate from Mount Holyoke College in 1883. And so uh, within a generation uh, you have uh, a slave having offspring who are of the black middle class, which is uh, an, uh, quite, a, quite an accomplishment in those times. But it was Parker's work as a conductor on the Underground Railroad that he was most proud of and least celebrated for until the recent publication of his long lost memoir. Now we know that because of Parker and Rankin, one black, one white, as many as 4,000 fugitive slaves are believed to have passed safely through Ripley. By the mid-1850s, things were changing on the Underground Railroad. 
Many of the fugitive slaves who had settled in the North went on to have children, and those children could be educated in the public school systems. With this burgeoning literate class, the written word began to replace the old codes and signals. But getting word back south was hard. Slaves were not allowed to receive or send letters by post, or to assemble freely outside of church services on Sunday. So black churches, by necessity, became the unofficial post offices of the Underground Railroad, and black sailors became the mail carriers. Do you realize that Charleston actually imprisoned black sailors when they came to port for the time they were in port so that they would not provide messages to free blacks in the city or to slaves in the city? But with the help of the churches, messages did get through. In 1992, historian James Horton found a bundle of old letters still hidden in a church vault. They were letters from an escaped slave who was living in Ohio, written to her mother who was still enslaved in Louisiana. The letters traced the young runaway's life. So when she got married, she wrote to her mother, taught, telling her about this man that she was going to marry. And when she had a child, she wrote to her mother, telling her mother about this child. And the last letter that I saw that she had written to her mother was telling her mother that this child had grown to late teenage and was about to enroll in Oberlin Collegiate Institute. And so we have this grandmother in a slave hut reading about her grandson about to enroll in college. Oberlin Collegiate Institute in Oberlin, Ohio is still in operation today. It was America's first integrated co-educational college. Oberlin turned out some of America's first black lawyers, doctors, writers, and artists, almost all of whom were descendants of fugitive slaves. Why Oberlin? Well, why not, the citizens of Oberlin would answer. Because of its strong Quaker, free black, and abolitionist populations, the entire town of Oberlin was, in effect, an underground railroad station. Fugitive slaves had lived there for 50 years with little threat from slave catchers and kidnappers. But the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 that had so changed the Underground Railroad in the East was also reaching into the Midwest. And when it hit Oberlin, it exploded. When he took on the revolting business of kidnapping, he forfeited his right to live. Every slave hunter who meets a bloody death in this infernal business is an argument in favor of the manhood of our race. Frederick Douglass. With the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, the anti-slavery movement had its back against the wall. No longer were speeches and poems and public appearances by Henry Box Brown going to be enough. It was time for action, and the Underground Railroad was starting to come out from the shadows to stop slavery on its tracks. In Syracuse, New York, a fugitive slave named Jerry McHenry is apprehended in the middle of town. But Jerry isn't going without a fight, and a crowd begins to gather as he is taken off to jail. Jerry is screaming to the crowd, throw me a knife so I can commit suicide. I don't want to go back and be a slave. This brings slavery into the faces of Northerners in a way that they've never seen it before. Now they see what slavery is really all about. That night, a mob estimated between 3,000 and 5,000 people attacked the jail. Then... In 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin is published. It sells one million copies in less than a year. I think Harriet Beecher Stowe's book put a lot of people on notice that you can no longer deny that certain things are happening, that you must be concerned about what is happening. It will tear this country apart. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a hundred pound bomb inspired by God fired at the damnable curse of slavery and the explosion would be heard around the entire world. Ohio Senator B.F. Wade, 1876. 
effects. And through the novel, the effect of the fugitive slave law on white America hits home for the first time through the person of Eliza Harris. When she gets to Ohio, she is taken in by the wife of the senator. He's apparently some state senator, Mrs. Byrd. Now, the moment Mrs. Byrd took Eliza in, this, this woman who's barefooted and her feet are freezing and her baby is crying and she's hungry and tired, the moment she does this act of Christian charity, She's in jeopardy of a $1,000 fine, a $1,000 penalty, and six months in jail. And this kind of drives it home to Northerners just how awful this law really is. Blacks and whites start arming themselves. They don't want to kill anybody. These people aren't interested in violence. Uh, but they're going to defend themselves at whatever cost. The mood among Northerners had changed. And nowhere was this more evident than in Boston in 1854 with the arrest of Anthony Burns, a fugitive slave. The word of the capture of this fugitive slave spreads like wildfire through the abolitionist community and through the black community of Boston. They actually break into the courthouse. A U.S. Marshal is killed in the process, uh, but they are repulsed. Their militia is called out. Uh, Franklin Pierce, who is the president of the United States at this time, is really intent upon enforcing the fugitive slave law. He calls out the Marines. And they descend on the city and secure Anthony Burns. The scene is unbelievable. The town is filling up with thousands and thousands of people. They rope off the Boston courthouse with heavy anchor chain so that the aged Chief Justice of Massachusetts, Lemuel Shaw, this very distinguished old man, has to climb under chains to get into the, his own courthouse. Now, for the abolitionists, they couldn't have asked for anything better. The pictures which they immediately start publishing in newspapers of the Boston courthouse in chains, of course, is symbolic that slavery has chained liberty in the home of Liberty, Boston, where the revolution began. The trial is brief. Because of a clause in the Fugitive Slave Act, Anthony Burns is not allowed to speak in his own defense. He is found guilty and is ordered returned to slavery. On the day that Burns is to be returned, the shop windows are draped with crepe. Uh, across the street, there is a coffin that is hung with the inscription, Here Lies Liberty. Burns is marched down the street through 10,000 people on his way to the wharf to be taken back to slavery. It's estimated that the federal government spent anywhere between $20,000 and $100,000 to bring one fugitive slave out of Boston. He was later sold for $962 at auction. The Anthony Burns rescue, uh, or attempted rescue, and his return becomes, I think, a pivotal moment in the anti-slavery movement because I think it makes the point that slavery happens to real people. And then, in 1857, at the trial of fugitive slave Dred Scott, all those real people are dealt the severest blow of all. Chief Justice R.B. Tawney hands down his decision in the Dred Scott case reducing all slaves to nothing more than property. The Negroes have never been, will not, and cannot be citizens of the United States. They have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. Chief Justice R.B. Taney, 1857. In one fell swoop, all the work that had been done on the Underground Railroad was about to be undone in the eyes of the law. Tawney is also worried that in the North, some blacks are getting complete equality. There are black voters in a handful of New England states. There have already been a couple of black elected officials in New England. When Anthony Burns had been seized in Boston in 1854, the lead attorney was Richard Henry Dana, who was a white man most noted for writing the book two years before the mast. But sitting behind Dana, helping him, was a young black attorney. I think that Tawney truly believed that blacks had only one place in American society, and that was as slaves. He did not like free blacks. He did not want free blacks in his world. At the national level, there was going to be no aid, no assistance, no recourse, and no place to go for blacks. It, in, it upped the ante. It intensified 
the situation enormously. And for them to be told that after doing every single thing you expect a good citizen to do, that you are not a citizen, you're talking anger here. People were just furious. Charles Lance Ramon stands up and says, we owe no allegiance to a country that grinds us under its iron heel and treats us like dogs. The time has gone by for the black man to speak of patriotism. We are talking about really angry people. Shortly after the infamous Dred Scott decision, the public outcry reaches west when a fugitive slave named John Price is captured on the outskirts of Oberlin, Ohio. Fugitive slaves settling in Oberlin lived uh, openly in the community and people felt that once they made it here they really were safe. In the public schools here in Oberlin, um, black and white children um, studied side by side even though, even though at that point in time the Ohio law forbade that practice. Of course, everything changed with the Oberlin Wellington rescue, which occurred in 1858. When fugitive slave John Price is captured in 1858, hundreds of citizens, black and white, nearly the entire town in fact, storm the Wellington Hotel where Price is being held. He is rescued by force and escapes, but the rescuers are jailed. And federal authorities expect these people to pay bail. Nobody will post bail. It's kind of what Martin Luther King later does in the Civil Rights Movement. You fill up the jail. Meanwhile, the local authorities indict the slave owner for attempting to kidnap a black resident of the county. White Americans in the North would, if left to their own devices, have dismissed slavery, had forgotten about slavery, would have removed it from the national agenda. But the abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad refused to let that happen. And by continually holding this thing up to the American face to say, face this evil, they uh, played an important role as agitators who ultimately helped to bring on the tensions that brought on the Civil War. The Wellington rescuers became heroes to the cause. Their exploits were reported throughout the North and the town that just wouldn't take it anymore set off a chain reaction that would be heard around the world. The rescue inspired one of Oberlin's native sons to take the anti-slavery protest one step further. John Brown grew up just outside Oberlin in Hudson, Ohio. He was the son of one of the town's first station masters on the Underground Railroad. John Brown is a person who hated slavery, who grew up in a household that hated slavery, in a town that hated slavery. Harper's Ferry really is a, a culmination of John Brown's behavior and his anti-slavery attitudes. It becomes more and more obvious to Brown that something dramatic has to happen, that the nation just can't keep going on the way that it's been going on. Blacks know that he is going. They are looking to see what happens because they have readied themselves for what they see as the coming war. They are ready to participate in the ultimate Underground Railroad. That is the Underground Railroad that brings freedom to the slave by force. And it is no accident that blacks participate with John Brown when he goes. John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry occurred a year following the Oberlin Wellington rescue. Um, the three African American members of his raiding party at Harper's Ferry were all from Oberlin. A couple of them had been among the rescuers in the Oberlin Wellington rescue. And when they were killed in the aftermath of the raid, the whole town mourned them. It does seem that maybe John Brown wanted to be caught at Harper's Ferry, that he saw himself as a sacrifice for the greater good. Uh, if that indeed is true, then John Brown's failure at Harper's Ferry didn't really exist, that John Brown was successful at Harper's Ferry because he forced the nation into making some hard decisions that the nation didn't seem to be prepared to be making before the raid. John Brown's raid was, of course, electrifying to the entire nation. You have to see it in terms of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 and the Dred Scott decision because it appeared to many people that there was nowhere else to go except some sort of armed resistance or some sort of overt act to begin uh, a physical end to slavery. The beginning of the end 
came with the first battles of the Civil War. It was not the first time blacks would choose up sides in a battle for freedom on American soil, but it was the first time they would win. I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free and that the executive government of the United States including the military and naval authorities thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. Abraham Lincoln. After the outbreak of civil war and particularly after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, the Underground Railroad shifted its focus. Abolition societies and vigilance committees became relief organizations, collecting funds, food, and clothing for the legions of African Americans who were now finally free. In some ways, the real work had just begun, and it continues to this day. Harriet Tubman served as a nurse, scout, and Union Army spy during the Civil War and continued to fight for black education and women's suffrage until her death at the age of 93. Close to the end of her life, Harriet was reunited with some of the former slaves she had helped rescue. As she was dying, about two hours before her death, she was conscious, and they were singing, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, coming for to carry be home. She died March 10th, 1913. She was buried with military rights at Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York. Frederick Douglass continued to speak and write for equality and eventually served as U.S. Marshal of the District of Columbia and then U.S. Minister to Haiti. After a lifetime of hard work, John P. Parker lost his business to an arson fire and wrote it into his will that he would disinherit any child who went into the family business. All six Parker children became educators. His son, Cassius Clay Parker, rising to superintendent of the St. Louis public school system. William Still published his personal diaries as the Underground Railroad in 1872. He died in 1902 and was buried in Philadelphia's African American Cemetery. The New York Times called him the father of the Underground Railroad when he died. This was a man who had one year and one month of formal education. So don't tell me, life is so hard, it stands in my way. You have to claim, you have to follow that star, reach for that star, just as our ancestors did. That's my message not just to our still children, not just to African-American children, but to every young person in America and really in the world. This is Mount Zion AME Church in Lawnside, New Jersey, where the descendants of William Still have gathered for their 129th Still family reunion. They celebrate the life of a man a champion of freedom who, like so many others on the Underground Railroad, has become little more than a footnote in history. They realize that it is only through the collective memory of their descendants and dedication to the preservation of historic sites that the Underground Railroad can take its rightful place in history. By not telling the story, important landmarks are disappearing into the urban sprawl. Congress has officially recognized the danger with the recent passage of the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Act. It authorizes the National Park Service to commemorate, honor, and interpret the history of the Underground Railroad.
and in Cincinnati on the banks of the Ohio River. A parking lot and freeway off-ramp will soon be transformed into America's first national museum dedicated exclusively to the Underground Railroad. What we want to do is tell the true stories of the heroes of the Underground Railroad. Not only those who are well known like Harry Tubman or Frederick Douglass, but those who are not so well known. We're simply a catalyst for people to go out and experience the Underground Railroad in their own communities and across this country. To be able to go to places like Ripley, Ohio, to the John Rankin House, to the John Parker House, and to go throughout uh, Ohio and, and across this country. Uh, to go to places like Philadelphia and to Boston and to feel the history and sense it in a, in a real way. I, I see the, the, the Underground Railroad story as just a major story with a tremendously important message for our time. Because if blacks and whites could work together 150 years ago under the kind of adversity that all of those people face, with the kind of danger that all of those people face, we don't have any excuses at the end of the 20th century for not doing at least the same thing. It's a story of communal activity and action, uh, selfless behavior, and coming together for a good long-term purpose and risking something in order to do that. Uh, this speaks to our condition, I think, very deeply today, and people want and need to hear this. The vast majority of people in this country want freedom for all. They want equal opportunity for all. We just don't quite know how to talk about it and how to come together on that subject. The Underground Railroad, I think, affords us an opportunity to do that in a, in a huge way. When I was seven years old, we had a um, Halloween dress-up party for school. And you had to dress up as your hero. I dressed up like a cowboy, came to school. Teacher praised my outfit. It was a brand new outfit. She said, you look really, really nice. But she said, who ever heard of a colored cowboy? And the class kind of laughed, I kind of laughed, not knowing what else to do. And it was certainly true, I'd never heard of a colored cowboy. And it wasn't until many years later, actually when I was in graduate school, that I found a book that said, A Life of the Negro Cowboy. And then I started to run across some of those people that we might call now the heroes of the Underground Railroad, like Harriet Tubman, uh, William Still, people who were black, many of whom were slaves themselves, but who were instrumental in helping other slaves to escape. And more important than that, keeping the whole issue of anti-slavery alive so that people in the country could not forget the fact that by the time of the Civil War, we had four million people enslaved in a nation that was supposed to be priding itself on freedom. secret tunnels crisscrossing America or ghost trains that ran in the dead of night. But the real story of the Underground Railroad is so much better. It's so much bigger than those old myths we grew up with. The history of the Underground Railroad is the history of America and shows us what we are capable of accomplishing in the name of freedom, no matter what obstacles may stand in the way. <laughs>